Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Kane Audio vlog. Uh, it is Friday, time for another AMA, but first for house admin. What is that? You know, I should probably think of these things before I start hitting record on the camera. Uh, right, this week there was something that I wanted to say to you, and what was that? It was, oh yeah, uh, I've hit a bit of a snag, oh I haven't turned the phone down, um, I've hit a bit of a snag um, when it comes to doing the review of your remix submissions because somebody has informed me that playing those remixes on YouTube will obviously enforce copyright issues and even though it's my track that is the copyright that's obviously owned by Mousetrap so it means I need to get legal clearance through not just Mousetrap but their legal partners and the publishers and everything like that so I'm still working on that idea but give me a bit more time what I might do maybe instead or as well or as uh, is maybe do some maybe if we do a Facebook live stream, maybe if I can set that up, that means not this camera, but I'll sort that out. Um, yeah, maybe I can do some sort of Facebook live stream and listen to everybody's tracks and we'll just flick through stuff on SoundCloud and I'll give just basic advice of, I think, Kicks or too loud, kicks are too loud, or snares wrong, or I don't like this bit, or I do like this bit, or it's amazing, or something. Yeah, maybe that'd be cool if we do it on another platform then, so we've got YouTube and Facebook covered, because why not? Um, other house admin. Uh, oh, my Frisky Radio mix. Uh, I've put together a two-hour mix for Frisky Radio because they've selected me as Artist of the Week, which I am very thankful for. Um, that's now available on Frisky Radio website. I think it's frisky.fm. I should have probably checked that before I started recording. Uh, that, I think, is just about it for admin. Yeah. So, yeah, there we go. Let's crack on with last week's... Uh, comments. <clears throat> I don't think there are too many. I have. I. I do watch the comments come in on on my phone. They sort of ping when they come in, and I sort of give them a quick skim at the time. And I don't think there's that many come in this week, so uh, the video probably won't be too long. Uh, right, starting with Zombo. Why not build your studio in your home? Uh, we'll save you from driving back and forth. That, my friend, is a very good point and one that I can half answer. I am looking at moving house and to an entirely different city and where I'm moving to and where I currently live and have lived for the last however many years, it's not been possible to have a studio in the house. Before that, I did have a, a sort of a two floor flat um, that oddly enough was uh, the landlord was a music lecturer and he'd sort of converted half the building into a studio. So that worked well for me. Um, I don't work particularly loud, but I sometimes work a bit late and I wouldn't want to be that annoying neighbor um, and I definitely can't work on headphones. I've said this on several videos. I'm rubbish at working on headphones. So I would rather not work from home. So I would rather rent a unit like the one I'm in now, convert it into a studio and whatever. And I've had this place for years and it's done me well. Um, however, so I've sort of hinted towards the fact that I'm looking at building a new studio. That's because I'm looking at moving house. And in the next house, I'm looking at a garden where hopefully I can build a studio office type structure of some sort there. So, yeah, there we go. 
Uh, GG11. Hi Dom. Uh, one, what's your opinion about the Arturia Synths Collection V or 5? Uh, how close are they to the real thing? I have used the Synth Collection. How close are they? Well... They're not identical. They have advantages and disadvantages. So disadvantages, I suppose, is is that the signal isn't true analog, and you don't get. But that's also an advantage. But but the disadvantages, you don't get some of the mistakes, some of the happy mistakes that you get in an old vintage synth. Um, personally, I quite like sometimes where maybe the pitch will drift on a on a cold uh, on a on a cold or a hot day uh you know your pitch might drift slightly and the older the machine the wider the drift uh so there's things like that that i i quite like so that's up to you on whether that's an advantage or disadvantage um definite advantages is you're guaranteed polyphonic um if you want it through software uh, the ability to save presets on, obviously on some vintage synths, you don't get to save presets. Um, in terms of sound quality, mm, I always struggle with this one because it, a soft synth emulation rarely sounds exactly the same as the hardware product. But that doesn't make it bad, it could be could be a better sound to some people and also let's be honest if you've got um I, I don't know some old vintage 70s synth doing your lead line and it's analog machine and it's doing your lead synth melody what are the chances when you've wrapped up that melody with chords, bass, drums, you know, percussion, uh, you know, big kick drums laced over the top, maybe a couple of counterpoint melodies, and you've got all of these sounds sort of in one big fat track, what are the chances people are really going to hear the difference between your 70s vintage 10 grand synth versus a uh, two three hundred pound software synth um i think it's very rare and, and and even more importantly if you're playing it in a nightclub or a dj set or in the car or whatever what are the chances someone somewhere is going to go hmm this isn't the original synth i i don't think people care that much so it's really down to you on what you prefer um so Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, two, how do you think about, uh, what do you think about Studio One, Cubase, Harrison Mixbus? Studio One, never tried it, I'll be honest. Never had a reason to try it. Um, I've seen it in action in a couple of events when I'm giving lectures and whatever. There, there's usually a stand with the guys doing Studio One stuff. Uh, Cubase, I used back in the very first versions after the Atari 2600 um i think i think my next thing was cubasis audio um which was before cubase vst which was before cubase sx um and yeah cubase is a you know it's great does the job uh, i don't really have opinions on these things uh harrison mixbus i funny enough eat my own words now harrison mixbus i do have an opinion i love it the 32c uh, I love the saturation on each channel and I have noticed there is definite coloration in some of the frequency ranges and th I've always argued that it doesn't matter whether you use Ableton, Logic, Bitwig, Cubase, Studio One, Reason, whatever, whatever you like, use that because the sound isn't that different, much like as I was just saying, when uh, if you're using a vintage lead synth, you know, when it's swamped in the rest of the track, how much difference does it really make? And the same goes with all of the other workstations out there. They don't, you know, they don't really have their own unique sound. Uh, people just think they do a lot of the time. However, Harrison Mixbus is is 
different because it does have its own sound. You can you can remove that sound. You can avoid having that sound. Um, but I do like that sound, and I that's why I use it for my mixes. Three. Uh, do you listen to Aphex Twin? Is there in uh, is there in the UK like a scene for that kind of music? Do I listen to Aphex Twin? No, uh, is the honest answer. Never really given his stuff the time of day. Um, I've been aware of his stuff since whenever, was it the 90s I suppose? And I think in the UK the scene, if I'm honest, the people that liked Aphex Twin were kind of, or the people I knew that liked Aphex Twin, were the people who liked Marilyn Manson or ACDC. I don't know why. That was kind of their their introduction to electronic. Um, so no, Aphex Twin was never really my thing. Is there a scene for that kind of music now? I mean, you say Aphex Twin to me, I think old music, but I, I guess he's probably done some recent stuff or something, has he? Um, I, I mean, for that sort of grungy, emo, electronic stuff, not really. It's not really a scene for that. I mean, I like to think we've got... Uh, how do I word it nicely? Somewhat superior production artists like Amon Tobin for example, which I know is maybe not comparable to Aphex Twin, but I do think Amon's stuff is pretty out there and pretty expressive, I guess. So, yeah, that's that. Uh, four, can you make any other mix down start to finish like the Enzo Bennett, Bennett track? Uh, yes, I can and I will. I am waiting for the right track. Um, and clearly because I'm playing someone else's track on YouTube, not all of my mix clients want their music played on YouTube, especially as I'm kind of pointing out, not mistakes, but I'm pointing out how it can be improved. Not every client wants that. Um, and also I need permission from the record label to, to do it as well because of the copyright issues, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I am definitely going to do mix down. What I might do is maybe one of my own tracks, but I'm not sure if that'll work because I know all my quirks. So I might just rush through it and it might not be so helpful for you. I'll look into it, but yeah, that is definitely going to happen. Also, the unedited, unedited big videos are the best. Keep it up, man. Cheers. Uh, yeah, I think I'd just rather just, uh, I, I prefer this format of just talking to you guys and you guys talking to me, yeah. Uh, Deadly Custard, thanks Domo, on the case. Found a DIY acoustic panels tutorial on Sonic Academy, so that's all good, cool. Uh, looking forward to hearing the new tune. Uh, so yeah, house admin at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that I've done a mix for Frisky. Well, my next mousetrap track is in that mix. Uh, I think you should end one of your videos with a little Moog jam. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, is that a bit... Yeah, that's not me, is it? Uh, I, that, that's a bit too... Uh... Hey guys, look at me. I don't know. Uh, Casey Music. Hey Dom, thanks for answering again. Uh, I have another video to do my part and give you input for your next AMA. Oh, I think you mean another question. Um, do you use a lot of distortion and saturation for your bass sounds to get the harmonics bigger and brighter? Mm, sometimes. If I'm going for like a sub bass now, I did a track called, I think it was yeah, I think it was Traction, and Traction came out on Wartone. Um, pretty sure. I mean, I know there was a track called Traction on Wartone, but I think it, I think I'm thinking of the right one, um, where there was some sub bass on beat one of every bar or two, um, and that sub bass was the Moog. So it was so I used the multi drive on the Moog. Uh, 
and generally then in the mix down process I'll use the Harrison uh, saturation on that as well um, just to give it a little bit more harmonics so that's really only if I'm using a subby bass um, otherwise I don't tend to bother really I think if I'm using like short stabby sounds you don't really need saturation on that because it's short and stabby anyway unless it sounds a bit weak and feeble um, so yeah so I don't, I don't tend to use saturation too much on the bass uh, for example, the low mid basses, oh here we go, on your Structures EP, it kind of feels like some quiet white noise on some points. Uh, I do sometimes on the synth, I actually add in some white noise and I have it super low down in the mix. Uh, there are some tracks I do, in fact, on X for some of the patches I make on that, I sometimes use a little bit of noise. Uh, because there's a noise module on that and there are some great sort of hums and white noise hisses and if you control the gain of that to tie in I suppose not perfectly synchronized but if for example let's say we're going for a short stabby bass note and you've got your env1 envelope generator and oh there's a fly in here uh, and your setting so you're setting your sharp attack <clears throat> somewhat sharp decay zero sustain or near zero sustain and maybe near zero release and then that's your initial sort of base shape and then i'll then maybe assign the envelope two to uh the noise generator uh, the, or the gain of the noise generator and I'll pick a usually a white noise I might filter that separately or I might go for a, a slightly different noise like a hum or something and then I will shape that so that it's a slower attack and a slightly slower decay so it's it's almost out of sync with the baseline but I mean we're talking fractions of you know down to milliseconds of differences so it's it's pretty much in sync but then i'll just do it super subtle so the the gain is you know barely registering uh so yeah that's something i do i'm so hyped for your track on waf 8 by the way looking forward to so much for all the great music that's coming on this album thank you very much uh yeah so that's now available in the mix i've said it three times now i'm not going to say it again uh no keyword this time <laughs> who knows sunset 86 hey dom uh you didn't get to answer my question from last week's uh oh okay uh, i asked whether you eq first i.e before you set the volume faders in a mix down or do you set the gain stage faders and then subtractive eq um i also asked right we'll finish that first one first um Yes to both, because, kind of, uh, so, um, right, I asked whether you EQ first, right, EQ, yeah, before faders, but that really doesn't matter, because it's EQ and we're in the digital world, so your faders can kind of be anywhere in the chain, if you're not clipping, then it doesn't really matter where your faders are, necessarily, um, but just don't move them then because if you're compressing before or after then obviously that's going to change uh but eq yeah uh yeah i always eq pre-fader um pretty rare that i would eq post-fader but maybe that would usually just be like an afterthought in the mix down or something don't know uh what was the second part uh and then subtractive EQ. Right, so subtractive EQ every time. I never use additive EQ. Um, I never raise the volume in an EQ, uh, uh, apart from maybe in a mastering chain or something, but that's an entirely different thing. But in the production and mix process, never use anything but subtractive EQ. So if, for example, I think, let's say I have a a synth and for some reason I'm not allowed to touch the sound design of the synth uh, 
so I need to EQ it because it's too bassy or maybe there's maybe it's yeah so it's too bassy then I just bring down the bass but if it's for example the bass range of it is fine but I feel like it needs some more high end what I would rather do instead of scooping up the high end I would rather bring down the mid and bass and just set a, a smoother curve so that it gives the appearance of having a higher high end. Uh, I think that hopefully answers it. Uh, the part two to your question was, I also asked what your rates were and if you only mix certain genres of music. So my rates do sometimes change, so I'm not going to say them in this video, but they are public on my website which is caneaudio.com if you go to services and then I've got a couple of tabs there there's mixing mastering production and then it's tv film sync stuff um and sound design I think I said that um so yeah just go to the the mixing page basically uh on caneaudio.com and the prices will be there uh, da, 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 da. however having said that with those prices as well they are sometimes negotiable depending on my workloads and depending on uh, what people's budgets are and also if for example you had an EP or an album or something and you're looking to get that mixed or mastered or whatever some help with sound design whatever it is you're after um, you know clearly this the the it starts as per track price but obviously if you had an album then you know there's there's scope for uh, that being much cheaper uh, 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 hope you get to answer next time PS I love the vlog cool thanks um, yeah there we go so I answered that uh, mark well hello there <laughs> hey Dom uh, loving the AMAs, keep them coming. Have you considered doing a podcast? Yeah, I did mention in one of the other videos, I think, I I quite like doing this sort of unedited kind of shit vlog um, and I'm, I'm tempted to do a, a pretty much unedited kind of shit podcast as well, but I'd like it to be available in video as well, so it'd be on YouTube and iTunes, Spotify, whatever. Um, but I'm trying to work out the logistics and uh, if I'm completely honest, I need to be able to afford it as well because I will need at least one other camera and probably other microphones because I have the Rode shotgun that you're listening to me on now. I've got things like the NT1As and whatever in the studio, but what I would like to do is travel to someone else's studio, set up two or three cameras. We've got wide shot and then close ups of us two and literally just sort of talk industry, talk about how things have changed, where things are going, uh, what we think of maybe certain bits of equipment or certain DJs or producers or it depends who it is. But basically, that's the kind of general vibe and that's where I want to be going with it. Uh, but it involves more equipment and so I need to kind of set a budget aside and do all of that and as I've said at the beginning of this video I'm, I'm looking at moving house and building another studio um, or a new studio uh, so that's going to be costly so there we go um, it's something I really really want to do but I just can't do it yet uh, as well as being a very insightful producer thank you uh, I think you have a good style and manner to be a podcast host thank you uh, you could also get on guest producers. Oh, I just said that. Uh, I'm thinking something like the EDM podcast, if you've heard of that. I haven't. Uh, do I want to? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to be stealing their ideas. So uh, I've kind of explained what I'd like it to be. So hopefully it's... Yeah, well, it, it doesn't matter whether it's like that or not. I've just said it without knowing who they are. Uh so yeah, Night Quaker. Hey Dom, have you heard of the company called Sheet? <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, Sheet, S-C-H-I-I-T. Uh, they make audio interfaces and I've heard they're pretty good. 
I would be happy to know if you've had any experience with the company and their devices. Uh, maybe they are indeed some good sheet. Yes. Uh, I have heard... Oh, man, I can't remember the name. There was one of their headphone DACs that I listened to... Oh, can't remember the name. Tiny little thing for laptops, I think it was. And I listened to that on a pair of high quality headphones and then compared it with a couple of others. And yeah, it was very, very good. Um, it was some good shit. So uh, yeah, I don't know about things like durability, compatibility. I don't know about those sorts of things because it wasn't, it wasn't mine. Um, but I have never heard anything bad about them. So I can't recommend them, but at the same time, never heard anything bad about them so uh next one i won't even attempt to say that i guess the exclamation marks are eyes in which case we're stick 77 <laughs> uh hi do you listen to demos from your viewers uh i have some songs but i have no one listening to my tracks um okay i do try to listen to demos from viewers i always say get in touch with me uh, on my Facebook fan page and just send me a SoundCloud link. If you are going to send me one, don't just send the link with no explanation. You know, just tell me, give me a rough idea of who you are. And I think this goes for if you're sending stuff to any label or producer, uh, give me a rough idea of who you are. So have you been producing for six months, six years, 60 years? Uh, where do you feel you are? Are you just starting out or are you fully fledged? I think these help us sort of develop an opinion because if you send me something and it's a bit shit, uh, but you'd only been producing for six months, then I wouldn't say, oh, this is shit. But if you send me something that's a bit shit and you've been producing for 25 years, I wouldn't say it's shit, but I'd probably be a bit more careful with my words but I'd be a bit more honest as well um, so I think these things are important and I think they're important for a label to know when you're sending demos as well um, and whether you've released on labels before you know just I, I'm talking two sentences maybe three at the most just hi my name is I'm 25 I've been producing for two years I've released 10 tracks here's mine um, and if you can make it downloadable, that's cool, because if I like it, I'll want it downloaded. Uh, otherwise, I'll, whatever. Uh, but yeah, uh, the hardest part is finding the time to, to do that, because obviously, you know, I'm working full time on my own music and various projects. Um, and of, often, you know, working with clients and whatever as well. So I don't have that much free time to listen to other tracks and what I tend to do is like when I'm when I have gigs DJing I actually tend to just go to Beatport and I try not to even sort of ask or get promos or demos I'd rather just buy the music when I like it um, and someone has replied Casey Music if you don't mind who is listening to your tracks and review them I can do it too awesome high five to Casey Music then everyone send your music to Casey Music um, and I'm going to restart the camera now because I can see I'm approaching the 30 minute marker and for some reason it auto switches off there. So I'll be back in a second like this and I'm back. Um, right. I should probably get a camera one day that doesn't cut out at 30 minutes, but I suppose it works as quite a nice reminder as hurry the fuck up. Uh, Nathan Zaskarinskis again. Hey Dom, uh, so what's the best way for a promoter to get hold of you? Ooh, I work in a nightclub and we're always looking for people to DJ or perform live, so I'll pass your details on for that. Uh, we're up in the northwest, so uh, it will be a bit of a trek for you, but I'm sure you'd do a much better job than the other acts we've had recently. Cool, um, okay. <clears throat> First of all, uh, I'm up in the northwest somewhat regularly probably once a month uh so that's not impossible for me uh 
second of all cool i yeah i'm always open to performing anywhere and everywhere if i think it sounds like it's going to be a good laugh um and if i think my music suits your event then cool i'm always up for that so in terms of promoters getting a hold of me uh i would say if you want an email address then the one on the cane audio website comes straight to me so go through that it's probably easier and in fact there's a contact form on the website they all come straight to me i'm not i'm not a team of 15 people i'm not a corporate thing um otherwise i guess facebook fan page i do check messages there uh i would say messages on youtube but i don't even know if i have any do i do, do i get notified of that i have no idea uh so yeah, don't send it there because I don't even know if I get notifications. Uh, but yeah, that would be cool. Um, I think that is all your questions. Hopefully I've not left anyone out. And if you have got a question for me, uh, then please do leave a comment below this video. And then I'll be back next Friday and I'll answer it for you then, hopefully. Uh, I don't think there's any other house admin that's come to my head over this past half an hour. Nope. Cool. Uh, let's say the keyword, if you've made it to the end of this video, will be sausages. Cheers. See you next week.